Good morning and welcome to another episode of the Visual Studio Remote Office Hours. I'm your host, Maz Christensen, and um, today I'm very excited because we're doing a very geeky deep dive into the inner workings of Visual Studio. And, uh, you know, this is just something for anyone that's been using Visual Studio for a long time, you might have been wondering, well, how does Visual Studio actually work? What happens behind the scenes under the hood? Um, and we're going to find out today because we are uh, in the presence of the great Andrew Arnett, who is <laughs> uh, quite the institution on the Visual Studio Engineering team. And uh, Andrew, uh, welcome aboard. I'll let you introduce yourself. Oh, thanks for that very <laughs> accolading introduction. Uh, yes, my name is Andrew Arnett. I'm on the Visual Studio Platform team. So uh, I do less of what you can see as you're using Visual Studio and a lot more of what supports other people who develop what you can see. Uh, and I've been with Visual Studio for more uh, 12 years. And before that, I was on the .NET, .NET Compact Framework team for a couple of years. So I've, I've always been behind the scenes. I do business logic better than I do UI. All right. Yeah, I think there's a lot of people that can that recognize that, um, you know, business logic over UI. Um, so let's just get straight to it. And, um, <clears throat> you know, some years ago, I was I was made aware of this thing that I quite don't quite understand. And I think a lot of people might find this interesting. Something happens when we start Visual Studio. So just to be clear, Visual Studio when we start Visual Studio, we start an executable called devenvxe.exe. And it's something about that we that it's a native process that boots this, the .NET framework inside of it or something like that, very special. And I never quite understood how this all worked. And so I was hoping, Andrew, that you could um, talk about how, like what actually happens when we, we start devenvxe. Sure. So uh, we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll even start by uh, plugging that uh, you, your assumption is that we start DevEnv. Uh, a lot of people don't know because DevEnv is what they install, but they're actually, those are what we call stubs, and we actually have several of them. Uh, back a few years ago, we used to have several smaller profiles. I forgot what we called them. Uh, different SKUs of Visual Studio, like uh, Web Express, C Sharp Express. These didn't start with Dev and Vexy. There was VWD Express, and, and even now, although we've gotten rid of the Express ones, uh, last I heard anyway, um, there are there still are other ones, uh, depending on what you happen to install. Uh, and if you actually look, Dev and Vexy is quite small uh, relative to the size of Visual Studio. So actually, most of the the meat of what we do that that stub does a few very specific things that only Dev and Begsy should have, but mostly it hands it off to another file that's in that same directory called msnv dll, and that's considerably larger. Uh, the PDB is, uh, if, if we install, we don't install it, but the PDB is hundreds of megabytes. It's, it's quite the code base. In fact, we link it from, uh, it's so large, we don't want to, when we are working in it, we don't want to compile and link the whole thing every single time, so we actually, uh, uh, you compile it into half a dozen libs, and then we link the libs together to just cut down on the incremental build time. So um, now you, you asked about hosts, like, so, so the process, we, we parse the command line, obviously, and that's all just regular C++ code. Uh, and a lot of that has been around for over a decade. Uh, there's, there, I mean, Visual Studio or its predecessors uh, have been around for a long, long time. Um, now the CLR, you may have heard of, uh, if you've done any kind of managed native uh, mixed mode processes, um, there's the CLR has a feature called It Just Works, IJWs, that's actually the name, <laughs> um, where you can load a native module that has managed code in it and it'll just magically load the CLR. Um, and we probably have some of those too, but uh, the way we load the CLR is, interesting. Uh, so in case it, I haven't made this clear, perhaps, uh, Visual Studio is not a managed application. It's a native application. And the different, the significant difference is if you compile your own WPF application, you can open that up in IL Spy or .NET Reflector and actually look at all the code. And it's all C-sharp code or VB code or whatever you came from. 
Uh, but when you launch it, there's a little header in that exe file that tells Windows this is a .NET Framework application. And so it goes and finds .NET Framework and lets it basically grok the whole uh, image that was your application. And it turn, the JIT runs and it turns it into machine code and then it loads it. Uh, but the, the key point being .NET Framework controls the process from the very get-go. With, with Visual Studio, like any other native application, there's no .NET Framework initially. The process loads, it does whatever it wants in C++, and then there's a few ways that uh, a native process can host, as we as we call it, the the runtime. The dot and it could be the .NET framework, it could be .NET Core. Uh, both of these runtimes uh, allow hosting inside of a native application, which is incredibly useful when you have an existing native application and you want to actually start leveraging some of the uh, abilities that .NET Framework or .NET Core, you know, .NET Standard bring to you. So if you uh, anybody can do this, and there are you know proper supported and actually surprisingly simple hosting APIs, so that you can get a your first managed DLL loaded. And at that point, it's all very C style interop. Uh, managed has its very very rich. A rich APIs with classes and everything. Um, and on the native code, we have classes. But at the interop layer, it's very much like Win32 APIs. The, the hosting API does not assume that you're even in C++. Any C program can, can access its APIs. And so the these hosting APIs, you call them, and you can say, hey, load this managed DLL. And that first call will <clears throat> cause the runtime to load into your process, set up everything, uh, and it'll load that one DLL and hand you back a, a handle, a, a native pointer thing to uh, whatever the CLR is using to track that assembly. And then you can say, hey, I want you to execute this static method defined on this fully qualified type. And you can just execute that. Now that static method could return anything. It could return an integer so that your native code can then go and do whatever it is going to do with it. Or it could be that uh, it returns something rich like an object, in which case you're going to get a, a CLR handle to that managed object. Um, and so we have lots of this kind of code in our native, in our native layer, but there's a totally, and I'm explaining it this way first because this is probably going to sound more familiar. Uh, and probably more intuitive, but there's an, a whole different way of hosting the CLR uh, that's actually what Visual Studio uses. This, you can, if you're familiar with COM, and there are COM activatable objects where the, these objects are actually registered with a system or in the process so that when you ask COM activate this thing, COM has, a, you know, has an idea how to activate it. Do I load the DLL? What's the entry point of that DLL? Where in the world can I find this type? Com has all sorts of rules for discovering all of these things. And it turns out, I mean, Com was designed to allow any sort of language to expose Com objects. And as if you've been a Visual Studio extensibility developer, you know that Visual Studio is all about Com. We're also all about .NET, but at the, at the root of it was Com. Before there was .NET, Visual Studio existed and there were, or, or its predecessors have. And we used COM all over the place because it allowed us to componentize different pieces and, and take in extensions and activate them. And it was very, very flexible. Well, the way we, st the way we host a CLR in Visual Studio, we first call a couple of the hosting APIs to say, hey, when and if you ever load the CLR, we want you to let us know. And by the way, we want to tweak. We're, the hosting APIs offers, offer you ways to ha take special control. So we control the app domain manager which generally speaking, uh, a managed app can do that through the config file, but a native app that's hosted in CLR has to do it through programmatically. So we say, hey, when and if you load the CLR, just let us know because we want to customize some things. But we don't actually say load the CLR. Then uh, as Visual Studio goes, at its very, very core, we have what we call packages, which is basically a co-creatable COM object. Um, so Andrew, yes. just before we, we get there, so. Just kind of to, to summarize here, I think a couple of things were super interesting here. Uh, first of all, Visual Studio, you know, which is maybe the biggest WPF application in the world, is actually native <laughs> under the, when you peel away the layers, uh, which is kind of an interesting thing. Uh, but you mentioned Win32 and COM. Is, so 
I assume that Visual Studio has these very strong um, dependencies on those technologies. And, and is that the main reason Visual Studio is Windows only? Like we can't we can't split Win32 and COM out of Visual Studio like very easily at all, or or maybe at all. So moving Visual Studio off of Windows isn't something that I've given a great deal of thought to, but yes, Microsoft only supports COM on Windows. .NET Core supports COM, but only on Windows. Uh, I don't know if Wine on Linux would give you some sort of COM uh, uh, abilities, but yes, Visual Studio does have some a, a lot of deep Windows ties. We call a lot of Win32 APIs. Okay. Good question. All right. <laughs> so, um, uh, basically, so so in the process of VS Start, we have a list of packages that have to be loaded in a particular order uh, because they're part of our bootstrapping. And one of the packages, it's not the first one, but somewhere in that list is a package that is a com co-creatable com object that happens to be implemented in managed code. And I say happens to, but we know which one it is. Uh, but by just asking com to co-create this com object, com looks at the registry and says, oh, to activate this, I need to go load mscoreee.dll and ask it to activate it. Well, that DLL is the stub that activates the .NET framework in your process. So .NET framework then loads, it calls back our little callback that we asked for, and then .NET will create the first package uh, that is in managed code. And then where I said before that these other hosting APIs, all you can do is <laughs> very, very primitive call this static function inside of a, a .NET type, it's calm. So now we don't just, we're not restricted to static functions. We, now we can, we have we have an interface. We have, uh, we define all of our common interfaces in ITL, uh, the interface definition language, I think, or yeah, I think is what it stands for. Um, but we co-create it, we cast to this ITL based COM interface, and then we can call whatever we want on it. And this is IVS package is the interface. Mm. Uh, and now we've got .NET running. And it turns out that at that point, that .NET framework DLL that was loaded can depend on anything else. They can go and activate other things. Basic .NET is now a full-fledged part of your process, and it can do whatever it wants without restriction that you might assume might, well, it's native, so it can't do anything unless native code says so. No, no, it's, it's just .NET. You can do whatever you want in it. Um, mm -hmm. The native layer has a little bit of say in overriding certain things, but even that's fairly restrictive in what we have influence over. Okay. All right, so that's interesting. So, so Visual Studio doesn't, on its own, create the .NET process. It's basically just by calling it, um, that, like loading that package, that it just happens automatically. Like Windows makes that magic work. Basically, is that? Yep. Do I understand that right? Okay. Yep. So, in if you have multiple instances of Visual Studio open, maybe even multiple versions. Visual Studio 2017 and 2019, and you have them both open, do they share anything? Like, do they both have to uh, instantiate the .NET framework within their individual processes, or is there some sort of sharing of something across? So, uh, a w long time ago, back in, I don't, I'm not sure what year we finally, I think Dev 50, so Visual Studio 2017, I think was the first one that got away from the GAC, is that right? Do you remember? Yeah. Yeah, I okay. think it was. So before Visual Studio 2017, a good chunk of our managed code was shared by virtue of Visual Studio just to always <laughs> installed almost everything in the GAC. And that is not something we encourage customers to do. And we don't even do it ourselves now. We At the time, we did it because, as you mentioned, <laughs> we are a very, very large WPF application. And there were some performance optimizations that the .NET framework uh, offered, but were only accessible if you were in the GAC, is my understanding of it. Um, also, and it wasn't even, it, when I say performance, I don't mean necessarily speed. When we when we look at performance in Visual Studio, we're looking at speed, we're looking at uh, memory pressure. And it turned out that at least back in the day with certain settings, uh, I, so I don't remember the, I don't know the very core details, but if you GACed and NGENed a DLL, which we had, we were doing that, that a lot, or uh, if you NGENed a DLL, unless it was also in the GAC, the CLR would load both images into memory. Now, for most processes, this isn't a big deal. But Visual Studio, it's a 32-bit process, and we have a lot of binaries. 
we don't want to fill most of that 32-bit process space with a bunch of not only DLLs, but duplicate DLLs, uh, because we want that memory available for users, for the data, for the projects and the solutions that they open, and for the analysis and other value adds that we have. So we, we, we would do things to share across, by installing it in the GAC, we would share DLLs on disk, um, but that, that was very painful, and we really wanted to be better examples to our customers as well. Um, and, and mostly, I think, we wanted to improve the acquisition story of Visual Studio. Those of you who've been around uh, for long enough remember, Visual Studio used to take a very long time to install mm -hmm. and a very long time to update. And now we've got this wonderful installer that will install Visual Studio in minutes and update in a minute or less. It's really, really great. Uh, and all of that was possible only because we got away from sharing almost all of our files. We still have a few MSIs that we have to install. SDKs tend to be among them. Like if we have to upgrade .NET Framework or a .NET SDK on your box, that's a global install. So Visual Studio will share that with other copies and versions of Visual Studio. But almost everything is in that one Visual Studio directory. So if you load Visual Studio twice, or if you whether or not it's the same version, I mean, it, if it's a different version or a different installation, you're going to read from disk at different locations. But once it's in memory, uh, I believe if it's on the if it's the same place on disk, Windows as a kernel will do optimizations to make sure it only loaded the deal once and it maps it into both processes. But as far as the .NET framework is concerned, um, anything that it had to JIT, it JITs in both processes individually, regardless of whether they were the same file on disk. Mm -hmm. uh, we we try to minimize our JIT cost. Uh, but uh, yeah, I don't know if that, that answers your question. Yeah, it does. It does. Um, so that's interesting. I remember when we when we got out of the GAC. Um, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong. That was the same time we got out of the Windows registry. It used to be the Visual Studio had so many registry keys that you know it would actually make searching through the registry I think slower because it was just a massive amount of stuff we put into the registry. All the settings, all. You know, user settings and global settings and everything was stored in there. And we moved away from that, like I think at this around the same time, right? And we did something else. What what actually happened? So yeah, uh, I think I can't remember for sure if it aligned exactly, but it was at least that time frame. Um, for a while we had Visual Studio used to be a singleton, like you could not install two of them within a major version, if I recall correctly. And so we had a very well-known key in the registry. Um, and then we allowed side-by-side -side installs. And before we left the registry, we got clever and allowed each installation path of Visual Studio to have its own key in the registry. And it was some bizarre random character set of like 12 characters or something that we would add to the registry key, which made it hard to know which installation went to which key in the registry. Um, so I think that predated we were still in the registry and that predated getting Visual Studio out of the global space. But yes, as part of allowing you to install multiple uh, minor versions side by side, or even multiple of the same version side by side, um, we needed to get out of the registry. Uh, and we very much wanted to. We were, as you say, we were, we were a humongous bloat to the registry. So yeah, now we are in a private, uh, I forgot what they call it, some registry private bin file. Um, it's in local app data someplace, and it's a few megabytes large. I don't remember how large it is, but um, it's still in a directory with that same weird hashy looking sequence of characters on it. Um, but uh, there's this, our, this, this really, really arcane technology that I don't recommend anybody use. <laughs> but, um, but in Visual Studio, it was, uh, it, was, it was critical to our success as a humongous, diverse application because we had been in the registry so long. We had untold amounts of code, including customer extensions that would run inside of our process and expect the registry to be there and for Visual Studio and the extensions settings to be in the registry. We couldn't just leave the registry um, without breaking everything. Um, and we try really, really, really hard, even across major versions, to keep as many as much code of our own and as ex for extensions just working. So we, we use, uh, it's called the detours. It's a technology that will allow you to redirect Win32 API calls to your code. And so we literally, if, if, if you had code, if you'd written a native library or a managed one that 
literally calls Win indirectly or directly calls Win32 registry APIs and you ran it in your own process, it would access the registry. But if that same DLL, not even a recompile, ran inside the DevM exe process, depending on which key it was trying to access, it would not actually access the registry. It would be diverted to our private bin file uh, or any number of other things that we might redirect things to now that we've moved out of the registry. Yeah, okay, that's cool. So that's why all my extensions didn't break um, because it's, it's almost like, um, you know, you mentioned IVS package interface. So all ex most extensions use a package class that they derive from for their as an entry point for their extensions. And um, and off of that base class, we actually have like user registry root, like as a property which returns a registry key. So it's like the whole registry thing is like so baked into the API of Visual Studio that everyone or many people just use it. And so. Breaking it was a non-starter, I take it. Yep. So you didn't, so I take it that you knew that you could detour before you went ahead and, and did more investigation into this. Yeah, so I, I personally didn't, but yes, we, we've actually used the detouring technology for a long time in Visual Studio. Mm -hmm. This was applying it to the registry, so it was a trick we already had in the bag. Yeah, okay. So in the beginning you were talking about like how we have managed and sorry we have uh, a lot of native code in visual studio and um you know once you get into the visual studio apis if you write extensions you'll notice that there are some concepts that seem non like that seem a little bit native for me as a dotnet framework developer uh it, it seems a little um non dotnet -y, let's say <laughs> and i think that's because some of it is just old right it's been and there's nothing wrong with it. It's been working for maybe literally two, three decades. And so how old is, like, what is the oldest part of Visual Studio that you know of? Uh, that's a good question. Um, so I, I'm, there are, there are people who have been in the org longer and would be able to give you a better answer to this, but uh, Visual Studio.net or Visual Studio 20, 2002, which is, the first version of Visual Studio that coincided, I think, with .NET 1.0 was not the first version of Visual Studio or its predecessor. So Visual St and, and before that, I think we, I, we and I, I'm sorry if I if I give anything inaccurate. This was a long time ago, even though I was a Visual Studio slash whatever it was called customer for much longer than I worked at Microsoft. Um, but uh, I know there there are under VB6. And uh, the the visual whatever we call it, Visual C plus plus developer the Visual C plus plus IDE mm -hmm. those two merged and Visual Web Developer I think is what we called it way back in the day you know the the classic it, ASP what wasn't there an interdev was yes that? yes yeah. that's what it was called way a long time ago <laughs> so all of those IDEs had this is back in the nineties right we're now yeah. we're in like the mid nineties something like that yeah yeah. Yep. And so, uh, so some of them had language support that we wanted. Other, one of them at least for, uh, provided a pretty good basis for a shell that would encompass everything. And so when we merged all these small, very focused products that were focused on one language or one particular workload, as we call them nowadays, um, we, we, we found some good basis for a, a shell and then we just started bringing things in. And that's probably when we, Probably, I'm, I'm guessing, when we came up with packages, uh, or maybe the, the package concept came from the base shell that we took from one of the other applications that we already had. But yeah, it was a very, very long time ago. So so that code still exists. Like we still have a bunch of that from back in, you know, interdev times that still lives in Visual Studio today? Probably, yeah. I mean, it, 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 Visual Studio is way too big of a product for us to rewrite it for rewriting's sake. Um, most people at Visual Studio would love if Visual Studio was a pure managed application. And that might be a question that your customers, our customers have. Why don't we just, why is Visual Studio a mixed mode? Why don't you just make everything managed? And you commented on the APIs and how the age shows. Most of us would love developing an all managed application. So it's not a bad idea. It's just so big and we want to deliver added value to our customers with every release and our releases 
are happening so frequently now, we just don't have time to rewrite native code that works. So we will continue to be a mixed mode application for the foreseeable future. And uh, as you say, some of these APIs uh, that make up part of our VS SDK are in, based on interop assemblies that come from old COM interfaces that still do the job. Uh, and so in some cases where they do the job, I mean, if, if, if they're just obsolete and they don't do the job very well anymore, then we'll deprecate them and offer new ones. Uh, but sometimes even if they're doing the job, but they're particularly arcane, um, we will offer managed wrappers that make things much easier to use. But uh, you know, you'll know, you deal with IVS solution and that's a, a native interface that has been around for a very, very long time. And so that's why you get these H results. Um, from a lot of our methods. A lot of people will call these int returning methods and not check the result and have no idea that unlike a managed method that would throw at you, it's not gonna, it's not necessarily gonna throw at you. It's gonna return an integer. Mm -hmm. Until, and this is this is where you get into the weirdness of the of the mixed mode application. As long as it is native code that's implementing that COM interface, and you can't tell. That's the whole point of COM. You, you don't know what's on the other side of this interface. You're not supposed to have to know. And that has, by the way, empowered us to replace. Over time, we have replaced a bunch of native code with managed equivalents. The error list used to be native, and it didn't scale very well. But in our age of Roslyn analyzers and very, very large customer solutions, you can have hundreds of thousands of er entries in that error list. The native code never would have handled that. So. That was an opportunity where, well, we could fix the native code or we could start from scratch in managed mm -hmm. code and make it uber, uber scalable. And that's what we did. Um, so, and a, and a lot of it has to do with um, um, like, so scalability and, and things we can't easily make things asynchronous, right? The error list is now async. It didn't used to be async. We now did a brand new implementation of find and files, which I think was also one of those like super old. Uh, native things that we we simply couldn't maintain it. We couldn't add new features to it because there was just it was too, it was basically too old, I think. And yeah. so so that's when we take the opportunity to say, okay, we have enough features we want to add so that we can um, so we can add customer value. Now is a good time to you know rewrite into managed code. Yep, yep. Dot net uh, dev ten. So Visual Studio twenty ten was supposed to be <laughs> originally. That's actually when I joined the team. It's when we were early, early in the Dev 10 cycle. Um, we were actually scoped to, I think, rewrite just almost the whole application in managed code. And that's when we learned, okay, let's not do that. But we did rewrite some very significant pieces. Like that's when the editor became managed. But we decided to have even the managed implementation honor the old native interfaces so that we wouldn't break extensions. And that was, they said, about as much work or more in, in retrospect, as it would have taken for us to fix Visual Studio and delete the old native interfaces. And we would have unhinged ourselves and been able to get even better performance, but we really didn't want to break extra extensions either. And of course, the editor is a very, very popular vocal point for extensions because that's just where developers live and breathe all day, every day. Yeah, right. So maybe let's talk about Visual Studio 2010 because that was a, that was a big change for us, right? We went from, whatever native UI mechanism we had at the time to WPF. So WPF didn't exist back in the 90s and early 2000s when when sort of modern day Visual Studio started. But then in 2010, we did that whole overhaul. We did the editors. It's also now all of a sudden WPF based, I think, right? And But there's a whole story to like, why did we start? Stop. Why didn't we do a full transition to from native to managed at the time? Like I remember there was like some talk about I wasn't there, so I don't know, but I heard sort of rumors that there were efforts, like editor was one area, there was a bunch of areas, and at some point it was decided let's we stick with the editor and and maybe the UI layer and and that was kind of it. Is is that just a rumor or do you know something? So that no, I, that that's that's fair. Uh, we did change the main window is WPF. Toolbars are WPF. Many of our dialogues are WPF, and of course the editor is. Uh, but for the same reason, you can't just take all of your Win32 or WPF applications and suddenly they're Windows XAML and on the store. Uh, that, I mean, it's it's expensive. And you and if you're selling a product, especially, uh, and if you're not, you're doing it for free, and so it's even harder, right? But most of us are developing software for, as a, as part of our business, and you gotta you gotta put the, the value where where the customers will actually see that value. And so, 
there's a lot of UI in Visual Studio. And uh, uh, now with Windows Store apps, you've got these XAML islands that they call it. Uh, and so you can actually bring your old, whether it's GDI 32 or WinForms, WPF, whatever it is, now we can mix and match different UI technologies, which is great. And that meets customers where we were a decade ago when we were writing Dev 10, we wrote uh, a similar technology that just allowed us to uh, weld together GDI 32, MFC, and WPF and WinForms. We needed to be able to say, well, we can't change this whole dialogue, but there's a new page in this, like the tools options dialogue, right? Um, that that might still be native. That still might be a native dialogue. I don't know. Uh, but certainly a lot of the pages in that tools mm -hmm. options dialogue have WPF controls in them. Um, so we have, we call, internally, we call it gel. It's just a collection of uh, patterns and interfaces uh, and the supporting code to allow WPF to be hosted inside of a arbitrary other window, whether that's Win, WinForms or GDI 32, I suppose, or MFC, whatever the window, the windowing technology is. And we can go either direction. WPF can host the old thing. The old thing can host WPF. Uh, and, and this is apparent sort of like, so Windows has come a similar journey, right? If you, you get mostly these new modern UI, but if you drill in deep enough in some of the settings, suddenly you find yourself in the old Windows 95 era control panel. Um, in Visual Studio, depending on which UI you're in, you'll say, hey, this is a gray dialogue and this is a black dialogue. It doesn't follow my theme or it does. Um, you can cut, you can kind of see which era a dialogue in Visual Studio came from. Uh, and once in a while, again, if we're rewriting the dialogue, we might, you know, if we're using WPF, we might theme it. Uh, and then you'll, oh, this looks fresh and new. And we like it when things look consistent and fresh and new. But uh, again, we would just, at the end of the day, a little bit of polish on the UI that makes it look consistent is generally speaking not as valued to our customers as adding features and fixing stability and fixing performance. Right, so we wouldn't necessarily go in just to add theming to a dialogue, a certain type of dialogue that maybe doesn't have that much usage or is a more of an edge case type of scenario or something like that. But once we get to, to work on it anyway, we will then do the work there. So yeah. uh, Eric has a comment. He says, it is, it is extremely impressive that you're able to deliver many new features given the legacy core code base. Yeah, I'll agree with him. It is, and I'm not an engineer, so I don't know what it is, but it sounds extremely impressive to me. Yeah. Good yeah. job. <laughs> some of our, I mean, the, the legacy code base shows through a little bit. It, it gives us some anxiety. I mean, the, so we have a method in native code that opens the solution. So file open project. When you load a solution, that's still native code that loads the, I mean, granted, it, it calls a lot of managed code to get the work done, but there is a method that's, I think, 5,000 lines long, one oh. method, oh. and it's native code. It, it, it's a beast. No, you, as you might have guessed, no one dares touch it, except <laughs> well, I need to add a feature, so I'm going to add it and make it 6,000 lines long, but I'd rather that than refactor it into smaller methods and follow all best practices, right? Right. So, it is sometimes painful to to make Visual Studio do what it needs to do, and sometimes that holds us back. But uh, I, I agree, and uh, I appreciate the recognition there. It, it is impressive what we can do uh, on without you know considering how much legacy code is there. Uh, it's it's kind of funny you mentioned the five thousand line uh, method. I don't. I think everyone, every team in the world has got a a method like that. Uh, I've never worked in a in a company anywhere where we didn't have one. I think we had. We, well, this was a class. We had a class that was 16,000 lines with st only static methods in it. Um, like this is this is before Microsoft old days, but uh, I think it's a very common thing. So now people, you know that uh, Microsoft, we do it too. It's not just you out there. <laughs> uh, Andrew, in 2010, I think something else happened. I might be wrong. It could be a different version, um, but we changed the whole uh, menu system, right? The way you can customize the menus changed, or maybe it, maybe we're talking even oh, yeah. even no, longer. I, I think you're right. It, it was based on Office 97 or something. Like there was, if you could today go to a toolbar in Visual Studio, right click and say customize, you're gonna get a dialogue that I think comes from some version of Office, right? I, I don't know where it came from. And what you're describing is the more recent behavior. Yeah, with Dev 10, we lost some things. We rewrote a lot of it in WPF, but some of the, I remember when, when 2010 
lost it because I felt like this is a sad loss. Now, I haven't heard anybody complain, and I honestly don't miss, don't miss it as much as I thought I would. It used to be, in 20, 2008, you could, I think it was alt, you could alt drag menu commands and toolbar buttons. You could rearrange your toolbar all you wanted just by alt dragging. You didn't even have to go to a customized dialog. Oh it was man, I, I want that. I want that now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was so slick. But as you can imagine, that that took a lot of that took an opportunity that probably doesn't come up very often for some developer or some team to say, "Hey, let's polish this otherwise very refined UI or this UI toolkit. Let's make toolbar." And I th I suspect it came from MFC because MF I think any MFC app could maybe do this. Um, but you know, someone decided let's invest in this and really, really give this cool, uh, nice, shiny feature. And when we moved to WPF, now we gained a lot of things from moving to WPF, whole lot of things uh, that have even proved, shown dividends lately with like high DPI monitors. That wasn't such a thing back in 2010, but WPF put us in a great position to have great support for high DPI, which we never would have had on the old system. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, so we, we didn't we didn't recreate that particularly customized experience of of changing the uh, the toolbars and menus. You, so we we still give it to you through that dialogue, and maybe as you say, maybe we got that from Office, um, but it's not it's not what it used to be. Okay, right. Um. Okay, so um, yeah, the high DPI is kind of funny because we added support for high DPI in Visual Studio 2019, and. It was problematic, right? Because there were, as you were saying, there were islands around in Visual Studio that was not based on WPF. If you were WPF, you, we, the different teams owning the different dialogues now didn't have to do any work, but some had WinForms UI and some had native UI. And then you had all the third-party extend, extensions out there. Some of them also had non-WPF UI. And all of a sudden, uh, things started not working. And that was kind of a bit of a mess to do the right guidance. We put out a NuGet package that people could use when they hosted their app inside Visual Studio. Actually, they could use it with any app, I believe, um, not just Visual Studio extensions. But that was like a big ordeal to move everyone over to that system. So that I think that that just says a little bit about like another another thing that we are faced with that maybe not that many other people are is that you know if we change something uh, in one area, it it affects like hundreds of uh, engineers on the team that they now have to adapt to this thing that we 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 added over here somewhere, and and is that the reason why sometimes there are things that we just don't do because they're just too risky or they're too they have too big of an impact? Like, how do we balance that versus just regular feature development from a priority perspective? That's a that's that's the million dollar question right there. Uh, I say million dollar, uh, it's probably a multi-million dollar question. Uh, so we've got um, product planning. Uh, I, I love how we do it in the Visual Studio org. Um, product planning is a bi-directional process where, you know, marketing talks to upper management and they say, hey, the next version of Visual Studio really should do this based on what customer demands are or, or what the market is doing, what our competitors are doing. And then from, from the, the grassroots efforts of individual devs and uh, people managers also get to say, hey, well, our the users of our individual feature really want us to fix these bugs or add this one feature. And so at the beginning of each cycle, we we kind of blend these two and figure out what we can what we can scope into it. And so what, when we're talking, uh, as I understood your question, how, how do we decide what to redo? It, it, it's a combination of those discussions of what high level and low level observations of and interviews with customers want and sometimes customers will ask the wrong question I, I, there, there's a there's a science name for it i think uh, but they'll say hey we for well here's a classic example customers will say we want 64-bit visual studio which isn't so much of a request as a prescription to a fix it's a solution to the problem right yes and often the solution that customers have in their mind is either more expensive or complicated, impossible, or not going to solve the problem as well as they'd like, or it's going to cause, as you say, like issues for neighboring teams or other extent. It's going to break all your extensions. You didn't think about that, um, and, and not not to overly criticize 64-bit VS. That is something we've looked at many times, and uh, we've we've looked at recently as well. Um, 
But as we as we zoom in with customers and say, well, why do you say that? We hear things like, well, my solution's big and I run out of memory. Okay, well, we can address that concern at least somewhat, if not significantly, um, doing other things that won't be as disruptive and that can allow more incremental progress to be shown. And so if you launch DevNVEXI today and you're watching the process tree with Process Explorer or you're just looking at Task Manager's process list, you'll notice Visual Studio launches a lot more than just DevNVEXI. We've got a we've actually got at least half a dozen half a dozen other processes running. And some of these processes are 64 bit. Roslyn, for example, is a humongous memory uh, hog. If you've got and not a diss against Roslyn, they add a lot of value for their memory. But if you've got a large solution, it's a lot of memory that Roslyn has to take. Turns, but they've moved most of their memory consumption out of process. Uh, and often in a 64-bit process. So we're actually breaking this, the, the, the boundaries of 32-bit address space restrictions and customers are able to load much larger solutions because we get we actually move a lot of this address space uh, out, out of the process. Uh, and this also allows us to think, because well, 64-bit, you'd never have to worry about it. You could avoid all that work. Well, yeah, but it costs you in other ways. 64-bit, is a larger pointer size. And so what used to fit in two gigs now requires three gigs. So now your RAM doesn't go as far. And uh, that, that's not as impressive now because everyone's got eight and 16 gigabyte laptops. But uh, a lot of, uh, some of our customers do, but some of our customers are still using netbooks with two cores. So we, we wanna make sure that we're, you know, uh, addressing all of our customers' requirements. Um, and there was some neat innovation a year or so ago that the debugger team came out with. Uh, p customers were running out of memory debugging, I don't know if it was Chrome, but some very, very large native application. If you debugged it, mm -hmm. as soon as you stepped into it once, VS would, would bomb. I think it was uh, uh, Gears of War. It was some of those big maybe so, AAA yeah. games or stuff like that, yeah. Right, um, and I, if I recall, it was because we were loading all the PDBs. And yeah, it was simple we, loading, yep. yeah. Now, if we had moved Visual Studio to a 64-bit process, it wouldn't have bombed. Maybe, and but it would have swelled to who knows? Maybe we would have taken 12 gigabytes of, of your memory. And if you don't have 12 gigabytes of memory, that means we're paging to disk and it's it becomes a slower experience, which might not be that critical, but every little bit it adds up and you end up with a sluggish VS. But because we're in that 32-bit constraint, the debugger team thought innovatively saying, hey, well, what if we rewrote how we read PDB so that you don't have to load the whole, every single PDB all in memory at once? Let's just read the little bits and not actually map the whole thing into memory. And it was an amazing, within 32-bit address space, they showed off this incredible improvement, which even within 32-bit address space, now we're, we're doing a lot less work now. And so it'll be faster even on slower CPUs and we won't need as much physical RAM. That's amazing. Um, so I think actually the um, that, that that native debugger we did end up moving it to 64-bit though. I'm pretty sure. But okay, that, that was that, that may be true too. But well. that was then orthogonal to like, hey, let's just consume less memory if we can, yeah. which seems to be the maybe the better fix, right, or the the more appropriate fix. Is that what the problem is when people say we want 64-bit Visual Studio? Uh, at the, you know they come up with a solution. Is the problem they have that they feel the 64-bit is the solution to? Is that about running out of memory? What is what is the type of problem that 64-bit would solve? Uh, from from what I have heard, and I haven't engaged with these customers uh, directly very often, uh, but the PMs have, um, and so what 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 I've heard from through the grapevine um, is yeah, they're they're usually thinking about memory pressure. Okay. Uh, being 64-bit has a few other fringe benefits, like I get the shape of a call stacks, the calling conventions are more hard, you know, very fit, fixed, uh, whereas x86 didn't define those things. And so it makes certain things easier. Uh, but I think mostly for most of our customers who, most Visual Studio customers aren't even developing extensions for Visual Studio, they're just consuming Visual Studio. Uh, yeah, 64-bit, uh, I think the, I don't know of any other really compelling thing that they might want besides solving the memory pressure problem. Right, but it's something that keeps coming up. Like every time we we blog 
on the Visual Studio blog, like regardless of what the topic is, people are asking about 64-bit, <laughs> you know, conferences, people, people come up and say, hey, when, when can we get 64-bit? And, you know, I often say, hey, there is already a lot of stuff that is out of proc. It's great to hear that Rosin is now out of proc 64-bit as well. That solves a problem for that particular area. Um, what are some of the next, do we, do we have like current plans that you know of, of bringing more stuff out of proc? Uh, we so we have a a lot of these processes that you'll notice that load next to DevEnv start with a service hub prefix. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we've actually had that for years, uh, and that is our convenient way. Because it it turns out uh, this problem this may not occur. I mean, we make creating a new process a new exe so easy in Visual Studio. Just file new project, create a new console application, and you're done. At Microsoft. Introducing a new exe actually has a lot of baggage, oh, paperwork. Um, you know, we need to know whether that process crashes. It needs to send telemetry. There's all sorts of things that we have to do. And so, in trying to encourage feature teams to move out of proc, we want to lower that barrier of entry as much as possible. And so, we offer Service Hub as, hey, this is a process that already is defined. Just move your DLLs over to it and we'll host you and we'll offer these services so that you can communicate back to Visual Studio. So we make it as easy as, as we can. And like I said, we've had this for years and we've encouraged, and many teams have moved over. And we are always encouraging more teams to do it. And we're looking for ways to make it even easier um, to not only move, but have a higher fidelity communication between processes. Uh, and we are, uh, some of this has been documented so that extensions can host themselves in Service Hub, if I recall correctly. If not, that's that's absolutely something we're looking at doing soon, if we haven't already. Um, so we they, want they, yeah. they can they can, okay. but I don't think we uh, documented how to do it. So it's like it's possible, but you will have to guess how to do it. I think that's <laughs> which is not where we want to be. Uh, I, I and I know that that's going to improve in the future because we we definitely want more. Uh, not only not only to reduce memory pressure, it increases reliability. Uh, a lot of our customers also use Visual Studio Code, and a lot of them love it. I I love Visual Studio, and I love Visual Studio Code. Uh, Visual Studio Code uh, loads very very little of an extension in proc. Almost everything runs out of proc. But they've developed they've defined the the hosting process and the API such that you wouldn't even know it. Like it, it just feels natural to develop extensions out of proc, and that's where we'd love to be for Visual Studio. And when those extensions crash, you don't lose any data. Like your your editor buffer and everything is totally protected. And Visual Studio Code just says, "Hey, do you want to restart the extension host process?" Uh, that that's a wonderful reliability uh, experience that we'd love to apply to Visual Studio as well. But it'll take a Visual Studio Code was was new. And they learned a lot of lessons from us and other applications, and so they they have a great architecture for that. Uh, we come with uh, 30 years of experience uh, and bruises, and it's going to take us some time to gradually migrate to a world where more and more code is out of proc, including customer extensions, so that we can have some of those same benefits. But I, I guess it's fair to say, so Eric um, had a, a uh, question here is if out of process is a usable path towards 64-bit Visual Studio, and if so, are you investing in that? So I guess the question is yes and yes, where it makes sense, right? Um, and yeah. even for extensions, we are looking at how to, like you're saying, to be able to host them in that out of process service hub type of process, and that could then potentially also be 64-bit. Um, and it's something we're looking into, but it's early, early days, so we don't really have anything concrete to share at this point. But um, it is definitely something that uh, it's going to come in some form or shape. We don't know what it's going to look like exactly, but um, but we'll have to do. When we know more, we should do another show on on that. That would be kind of interesting. Yeah. So today, Andrew, the Visual Studio is um, running on .NET four point eight or seven two. 472? 4.8. We we guarantee we require 472. I think depending on the workloads you selected, we might install .NET Framework 4.8. Most people have 4.8 anyway because of Windows updates, but we don't require it as a product. Okay. So yeah, so when you write an extension, for instance, for Visual Studio, it has to be in at least 472, but it can be 478 if you want to. Uh, if your extension targets 4.8, then you'll run on a subset of the installations. Uh, I don't know what size the subset is. Uh, you, so you could. In fact, I, I 
but but I, I should caveat this because there's something I don't understand about it. When and you're targeting Visual Studio 2017, which only guaranteed Net 4.6 was on the box. I have, and some people have, developed extensions that targeted 2017, but required .NET Framework 4.7.2, which at the surface, I reason is fine because for, I'll, I'll require 4.7.2, my extension will only work on that, but most of customers have that on the box, and so that's fine. But apparently there are some very, very subtle issues. Um, depend, I suspect it's depending on which APIs you access or whatever. .NET Framework is in a mode, and this goes back to our hosting discussion from earlier. When you host the CLR, or even when you're just running as a .NET Framework app, your app exe config file can tell the, .NET Framework, which version of the runtime you want it to emulate. So although you have .NET Framework 4.8 on the box, unlike .NET Core, where you have as many runtimes as you want, on .NET Framework, it's a singleton. And so 4.8 has to be able to emulate behaviors of 4.6, 4.5, 4.0, and it does that for an app at, a, at a process level based on the content of that exe config that says which version of .NET Framework you had in mind. And so Visual Studio, uh, has that too. In When we host it, we say, look, we have, and back in 2017, we said we have 4.6 in mind. So the .NET framework is going to behave like a .NET 4.6 application. So if you load an extension that targeted 4.7.2, it might work, it might not, depending on whether you trip over one of those uh, behaviors that are actually different between the two versions. Right, right. So um, does that then mean that if Visual Studio switched to .NET Core or .NET 5 at the time when that happens, um, will that be the answer to all sort of things like mismatch .NET Framework, easier 64-bit or better performance? Like, have we even looked into it? What, what's, the, what's the state of, of upgrading to not even released yet versions of the .NET Framework? So that's a really interesting question. .NET Core promises a lot of uh, performance improvements. It's it's exciting to see the .NET Core team's blog. And we can drop .NET Core as, you know, when, when we refer to .NET for five, as it's branded, they it, it drop the core from it. Um, but the blog talks about some of the significant perf improvements, and we've heard from customers that they are they are impactful. Um, so, and, and memory, so memory and uh, speed improvements uh, are there. Um, as far as version differences, their .NET Core, uh, I believe, does not support multiple runtime versions in the same process. Uh, although their APIs allow it, so maybe they're allowing themselves the freedom to add that in the future. But uh, if, if I recall, their documentation said, look, you can only load one. So even if uh, hypothetically Visual Studio moved to .NET Core, we would still be deciding what version of the runtime everyone in the process would use. So if there was an extension that targeted VSX, where X was the first one that, let's say it was .NET 10. Um, and somebody was targeting that version of VS. And then on, on the next version of VS, we loaded that same extension and that version of VS shipped with .NET 11. They would be running on 11, not 10. So this, this whole .NET core side-by-side -side runtime thing is awesome, but it's a per process thing. So you can run dev you, uh, VS 30, and VS31 on two different versions, literally different versions of the runtime as opposed to .NET Framework's emulation. You could run them in the different versions of the runtime, and that's great, great for isolation, great for reliability. Um, uh, but the extension would need to target the, less, the least version of .NET Standard or .NET Core that it wanted to support for VS. If that yeah, I was, a, I was about to say like the .NET, doesn't .NET Standard remove that issue? So you can say Visual Studio 2000 and 25 uh, uh, supports .NET standard 5. And so any new version of Visual Studio after that that you know also supports .NET standard 6, 7, 8, they will all support .NET standard 5, right? Because I think that's the way it's worked so far. They're backwards compatible. So yes, that, does that, that solve some of this? Uh, yes and kind of no. Um, it, yes, it does solve it, um, and that is the idea of the .NET standard. However, they, the .NET team has uh, announced uh, a few months ago that .NET standard 2.1 is the last version of .NET standard. Since .NET Core 3.1 is the last version of branded as .NET Core, and the next one is .NET 5, and because it's part of .NET 5 slash 6 now, 
um, mono and the mono runtime and .NET Core runtime are being well, they're be, they'll share a BCL and they'll 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 be I guess some sort of a pluggable or swappable runtime underneath your application based on what platform you're targeting, and I I don't know all the details of that, but basically everything's going to be branded as .NET. Uh, and there's no more .NET standard because there's just .NET. So .NET, if you're, you can target .NET standard 2.1 if you want today, and then, and that, but you, but you've already given up .NET framework. Um, so .NET standard 2.0 is the last version where you can target both runtimes. So if and when Visual Studio moves to .NET 10 or .NET 5 or whatever it is, um, that, that's what people will target. They won't target .NET standard because that'll be years old, mm -hmm. and it'll be a tiny subset that doesn't matter because once Visual Studio is on, .NET Core, it would be, uh, you would just target that version of .NET. You'd be targeting .NET 8. Right, right. It wouldn't be a standard to worry about. So if you were to have any .NET, stand, .NET Standard 2.0 code in, in, your Visual Studio, in Visual Studio today, or if you were write an extension and you have .NET Standard 2.0, then that's relatively future proof in this world, isn't it? I mean, obviously yes. you, you can't do .NET Standard code against the Visual Studio APIs because they're .NET framework only, right? But the underlying business logic or whatever you might have would continue to work into the future. Also, yes. if it's 64-bit, right? 32, like that doesn't matter at that point, I think. Is that right? So that's that's a different uh, axis. But wait, so, so we'll, we'll talk about the .NET standard first. Yes, if to, to the extent that anyone, whether you're running code that's going, or building code that's going to run in Visual Studio's process or any other process, to the extent that you can target .NET standard 2.0, that is a fantastic idea. Um, it, you're, it, it's great at future proofing and allowing you to run, not even just future proofing, just today proofing. Like you want to run on mono, .NET Framework, .NET Core, .NET Standard 2.0 is the way to go. It's awesome. Um, as far as the 32-bit versus 64-bit switch, um, nat both native and managed code have to be written with multi-architecture in mind. Most managed code is multi-architecture automatically. It's actually because most managed code doesn't use pointers. And when they do use pointers, uh, it's it, even that doesn't tend to be too problematic. In native code, again, most native code can just be recompiled for 64-bit unchanged. It's it's the edges, though. Both native and managed code can do this. You, in, in native code, you might use int where you should have used a pointer. Uh, in fact, this shows up in our interop assemblies. Uh, it, back in the day when we were writing our COM interfaces in ITIL, there was syntax that we could use to say this re represents a pointer, another syntax to say we want a 32-bit or a 64-bit integer here. And we use all of these. Occasionally, in these ITIL files, we were, we were dealing with something like a handle, and internally, say the project system, is filling this value with a pointer. But the ITIL provides it exactly 32 bits. Well, crap. We should have made that interface be pointer sized instead of a fixed 32 bits. Because when we recompile that native code as 64 bit, now the project system is broken hmm. because it thinks it can cast this handle to a pointer, but it can't because the pointer is now 64 bits. And so you lose data on one side, and on the other side, you get a corrupted value. So that can happen in the native code. And on the managed side, too, if you're writing an interop with native code, you might have a struct, and the headers say, hey, this is a pointer, and you could have gotten away with just using a 32-bit integer and got, you know, been fine. But as soon as you're running in a 64-bit process, that same managed DLL fails. Okay. And so in C sharp, you can tell it, look, this is specifically a 32 bit image DLL or a 64 bit or an any CPU. And any CPU is the default. It doesn't mean you're going to succeed in both architectures. Uh, you might, you probably will, unless you are doing interop and then you have to be careful. Okay. Um, Andrew, this is, uh, this is uh, super cool to hear about all this stuff. Um, we're at the end. Um, we got like a comment here from Jonas. He says, this is not a question. I just want to say thank you for an amazing developer experience. So thank you for that comment, Jonas. That's awesome. And then Eric has a question here as well for you, maybe, Andrew, because um, this used to be owned by you. He asks, any plans to improve or release the 
new project system API. I assume he's referring to what we call the CPS, the common project system. I would love to say yes. We started that in Dev 10 <laughs> uh, with the idea that this would be the new project system API uh, for so many reasons that hasn't happened yet. I can't say what the plan is for that. I, I'm afraid I can't answer that question. I, I'm not on the team anymore, so I'm not even privy to it. And if I were, I'm not sure I could say. OK, all right. Well, we had a try, right? Um, yeah. Thanks for the question there, Eric. Eric is uh, is one of our top extenders. So uh, well, thank you, know. you, Eric. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we're at the we're at the end here. So Andrew, thank you so much for for joining us here. It was uh, great having you on. I hope we can do this again some other time. I assume we're going to get a lot more questions in the months to come of very technical nature that you can help shed some light on. So thank you for for that. No problem. A pleasure. And um, to everyone else um, watching live, thanks for the for the questions. And uh, if you watch this on YouTube. Make sure to subscribe to the Visual Studio YouTube channel. You will see in the description below there should be some links to both Andrew's and my own uh, Twitter, so that uh, you can stay in contact and uh, leave a comment. We'll uh, we'll monitor them. So, thank you so much for joining. See you next time.